You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. I'm Brendan Cole. Egypt's feuding politicians have today signed a document that renounces violence. That was at a meeting convened by the country's most influential Islamic scholar. After a week of bloody protests that have left more than 60 people dead, Sheikh Ahmed al Tayeb, head of a thousand-year-old Al-Azhar University and mosque, called the meeting. The meeting was attended by top officials of President Mohamed Morsi's Muslim Brotherhood, as well as secular opposition leaders who had previously rejected Morsi's calls for talks. They urged continued dialogue to counter the widespread violence. It all comes in a week that marked the second anniversary of Egypt's revolution that saw the overthrow of the regime of Hosni Mubarak. January the 21st, 25th, 2011 was the start of 18 days that shook the Middle East when hundreds of thousands of people filled Tahrir Square demanding new jobs, education, the right to form political parties and the end of dictatorship. But last weekend near the Suez Canal, 33 civilians and two police officers were killed after relatives tried to storm a prison that was housing local football fans sentenced to death over a bloody stadium stampede last year. Ten people were killed during anti-government protests in Suez. There were riots in Port Said. And also on Sunday night, the President Mohamed Morsi declared a state of emergency in those cities, as well as the city of Ismailia. Well, does the transition to democracy work? How long will the transition last? Do Egyptians indeed have that much to celebrate two years on from the revolution? Well, to discuss this, I'm joined in London by Mohamed Desmara. He's an Egyptian opposition activist. We'll be joined later on by our studios in Washington and in Moscow. Mohamed, thank you very much for joining us. A warm welcome here on The Voice of Russia. I'd just like to get you your view on the talks today that those who ended, attended the talks today did include Muhammad al-Baradi, Amr Musa who was the, of course the former Egyptian foreign minister uh, under the Mubarak uh, regime. The, the, the words that came out after those talks, are they cause for optimism do you think? Um, thank you so much Brandon for having me today. Um, um, fortunately today just before we start um, we had um, a good um, a clue or a positive um, thing. Um, I think it's um, it's a good start for a course of optimism, um, but unfortunately we learn not to trust anyone too much uh, and we learned it the hard way. Um, there was plenty of promises of um, proper dialogues and uh, more understanding, uh, but it never came um, um, it never came as a practical steps on the ground. So um, overall, um, I think we have to sit tight and, and watch for the next uh, couple of days what is the, act- the actual um, reflection of, this, um, of today's um, um, statements on, on, on the grounds and how much influence does um, every party um, who shared uh, the statement today has on the grounds. We had the um, Imam al-Azhar Sheikh. We had um, um, a massive uh, big figure from uh, the Egyptian church. Um, there was Amr Musa, there was al-Baradi, um, and the, uh, the Amr Musa and al-Baradi until very recently were uh, refusing the dialogue um, with the government. So I think, I think it's, in a way, it's a good start. Uh, and I suppose the words that came from uh, Sheikh Hamid al Tayeb does give some kind of in, uh, view as to what needs to take the process ahead. He did say that political work has nothing to do with violence or sabotage and the welfare of everyone mm-hmm. and the fate of our nation depends on respect for the rule of law. I mean, what, how, do you interpret, how do you interpret those words, do you think? I think it's, um, it's a catch-22 because after the revolution, you're, um, well, it, there is the vibe of everyone speaking out and trying to make his point, whether in media or in the streets or actually in any... Uh, you know, um, private dialogue. And at the very same time, you need to see Egypt back, the state, uh, the government, the police, the foreign minister, everything that makes any place a country, you need to see it back. And I think the balance between these two is very difficult. um, um, And it it will need a lot of understanding from the nation. It will need a very drastic measures from the government in the police and and, and implying the law. But I think what Taib meant today is um, he's, he's not saying don't go out and protest. I think he's just, um, it's, he's asking people not to be dragged into violent um, uh, clashes because we've had enough bloodshed, no matter what, um, no matter who dies, they're, they're all Egyptians at the end. 
But in terms of the clashes that you refer to, and obviously on the on the 25th of January, two years on from the start of the revolution, uh, um, a significant day, but we've seen quite significant bloodshed. I mean, what's your feeling of the level of antipathy in t- on the streets? Do you think that, um, could, could we compare it with the protests of two years ago? It does feel quite sinister, doesn't it? Especially with um, people being shot and quite considerable violence in more than one Egyptian city. Um, um, I, I totally agree with what you're saying. Um, um, and, and as I said, there are many ways to look at it. Um, it. It was totally different because there was a political decision to stay in power and it was not based on uh, these, the, the ex-government or Mubarak was not democratically elected. And he only used the police um, to actually uh, stop the protesters from expressing what they believe in. Um, and even the violence that happened on the 25th of January, 2011, um, a huge part of it was planned by the own police by opening the prisons and by, by allowing the thugs to go out in the streets. And the very same thugs and the very same organized crime is still active on the ground. There is hundreds of thousands of thugs that we've been paid by the Egyptian police, the ex-Egyptian police, um, and they're still um, uh, like active. And th- these people have taken uh, a huge part in what's going on these days. So on the ground you have peaceful protesters and there is a, a big mix as well. And it makes the police um, um, a position very difficult to, to deal with them. Um, uh, from what I have been collecting uh, the last couple of days is, yes, there was um, violence from the police, but um, it is not comparable at all to, was, uh, to the way it was on the 25th January two years ago. But on the other hand, there was um, attempts to break into prisons and there was attempts to burn uh, public buildings. And I think this is where we have to stop and, and think carefully because um, no one is immune anymore. If you if you let go with the um, uh, bad stuff that happens now without... Uh, addressing it, I think it it will carry on and on for the next few years and we can't stop it. I'll throw over to our um, studio in Washington to Rob Sachs, our presenter there. Thanks so much, Brendan. And here in our Washington, D.C. studio, we have Dean Ahmad. He is president of the Minaret of Freedom Institute. And um, Dean Ahmad, I want to see if you could maybe respond to uh, some of the things we're hearing from uh, Mohamed Omara uh, in London. First of all, can you gauge uh, from your from where you sit? Do you do you feel like Egypt is close to where it was two years ago? Are we again on the verge uh, of a collapse in in this fragile unity that uh, we've seen grow in the past couple of years? Well, I hope not. Um, I I agree pretty much with the uh, analysis that uh, Mohammed Ismara gave of the uh, <coughs> current situation, uh, but I think uh, that it's different from what it was two years ago. Uh, if you understand what the background is, and and he alluded to this. <clears throat> Two years ago, you had a situation of a t- thoroughly undemocratic regime, and the people had no means of <clears throat> trying to get them out except to take to the streets. In the current situation, I think what you have is uh, a new situation in Egypt, a democratic, relatively democratic atmosphere that perhaps the various parties and factions are not used to operating in, and so they're making various uh, mistakes. Um, You had a flawed constitutional process to start with, and this resulted in a resentment on the part of the people who lost the popular vote. Uh, Their reaction resulted in uh, in the fear of an abridgment of the process by the winners of the vote, who were afraid that the whole uh, process would be aborted by the military. Uh, They overreacted, and that in turn led to an exacerbation of the situation. Uh, And now you have a new element that actually has almost nothing to do with the democratic process, and that's in Port Said, these uh, crazed soccer fans um, uh, who are very indignant about what may be an overreaction on the part of the state to uh, a violence that took place uh, previously for something that had nothing to do with politics, but which becomes political because it raises the question, does the current government know how to deal with the kind of threats to civil order that that are posed by by these uh by these soccer fans and it's uh <clears throat> it's a good question i'm i'm very pleased to hear about uh the meeting this morning uh hopefully uh if the various factions will just commit themselves to uh, uh all all nonviolent means of expressing their dissatisfaction uh, the system can become a self correcting system it can achieve a greater level of democracy than it's managed to so far you know, as outside 
observers uh, here in Washington, often we want to know who are the good guys, who are the bad guys. We hear names like thugs being thrown around, but that can be a loaded term, something to use against uh, whomever you want to cast in a bad light. There's so many different factions uh, vying for power. Um, who Who is really, in terms of people who have power, there's um, the religious community, there's Morsi, his government, the police, the military, the brother, Muslim Brotherhood. Who really um, is someone that the United States can say, uh, and, and the outside community, we can, we can feel comfortable uh, negotiating with this faction because we feel like they really do have the best interests of the Egyptian people in mind? We have many factions there. Obviously, you've got the ultra-conservative Islamists, you've got the moderate Islamists, you've got the liberals, the secularists, the leftists. Uh, I don't think any of these groups are inherently thugs. Now, there may be thugs among any and all of them, and they're going to cause problems, but I don't think when you see violence spring up that you necessarily know who's causing it. It's too easy to pretend to be a member of the other side in order to in, provoke hostility against the side uh, of kind of false flag operation, if you will, in order to uh, provoke hostility. Uh, I think uh, that uh, uh, that from the viewpoint of the uh, the United States, Russia, all all the foreign parties observing what's going on right now, the best thing for them to do is uh, to remain as uh, uh, observers and commentators, uh, but not to try to get involved in any uh, direct way in, in taking sides. We don't have to be. We don't have to pick sides because this is the business of the Egyptian people. It's not our business. Well, I wanted to ask that question uh, to our guest in Moscow, Nikolai Surkov. He's a Middle East observer at uh, Nezavizimaya newspaper. And Nikolai, in terms of picking sides, this is something where Russia has said in, in other conflicts in the Middle East that uh, this should be worked out on its own and has pointed to the situation in Libya as something that said, we picked the side, now there's chaos. Is this another situation in Egypt where American intervention to uh, help oust uh, Mubarak was perhaps... I don't know if it was misguided or maybe looking back at it now two years ago and thinking maybe it should have been done in a different way. Um, what, what, what's the opinion in, in Russia right now in terms of picking sides and, and giving aid to these uh, emerging democracies? Well, uh, good afternoon. Uh, speaking about uh, picking sides, well, obviously Russia is usually forced to pick sides. It's not choosing just out of you know, some kind of a whim. In Syria, this is the result of Russian views and Russian concern with the situation, not only in the country, but in the region as a whole, especially uh, remembering uh, the experience of Libyan conflict. But in Egypt, the situation is quite different, even from uh, the Russian point of view. Uh, and Russia is uh, quite friendly, I'd say, with the current government, actually, all necessary contacts were established and now what we really want to see is a stable and prosperous and peaceful Egypt. So Russia is not going to interfere in this uh, well internal issue any, well anyhow. So we, uh, I'm sure that Moscow will do anything it can in order to support the current government and to support the stability of Egypt. But it's an internal affair. Absolutely. Um, I'd like to uh, go back to Mohamed Amara, who's an Egyptian op opposition activist based here in London. Um, I suppose the point there, uh, uh, Russia doesn't want to get involved in the, in the internal poli politics of other countries, um, and they have a very strong view as to regard the narrative of the Arab Spring, to say the least. But I would, would, would like to get your view on... Um, on, do, you, do you think there is a feeling, perhaps in the Western community, in, in the West, that this is less of a revolution and, and, and more, less of a post-revolutionary Egypt and more of a post-dictatorship Egypt, that that, that that transition period hasn't even really started yet? Um, thank you so much, Brandon. Uh, well, um, can I highlight on the Russian um, um, position, actually? By all from, means, yeah. Um, well, um, I can only say that um, Egyptians, the West, the Americans, anyone... Actually, it's not a choice. It's a must that we help the current government. I think the difference is how are we going to help it? Are we going to support it in public? Are we going to try to correct its mistake, mistakes in private? Um, I don't think Russia can do much for two reasons. It has enough on its plate regarding Syria. And I don't think the Egyptians or the Arab world will take any 
um, thing uh, or any proposal by the Russians seriously because we've, um, in our opinion, uh, what the, the, the Russian um, um, situation with Syria is just shameful. Um, and we think they have let the Syrian people down as, as an, an, an opposition mass in the Arab world or actually as a random um, Arabic um, um, uh, citizen. Um, uh, the Americans, um, the American situation before the revolution, just when it was happening, was very shameful and very confused. Hillary Clinton was stating that it's um, Mubarak's regime is, is is quite stable and um, they, not, they don't have any concerns. And two weeks later, they had to uh, agree on the um, new changes. And we all know that um, the big generals of the Egyptian army were in um, 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 in, in America. For I mean, uh, Sami Annan was there most of the time. And a lot of the um, Egyptian politics and the politics in the Middle East is influenced by the Americans in a way or another. At the end of the day, if any party decides to take this um, government down, um, there is no guarantee that the next one will not be taken down within a few months and then the next one we can stay like this for 100 years or even more. I think um, we should all learn the lesson. Um, two years after the revolution, there is, uh, I, I love the expression, um, almost democratically elected um, um, a government. It's a democratic process. Um, the Egyptians themselves, they need to learn a lot about democracy and about respecting each other. Um, and about accepting different points of views. You've, you cannot really um, call yourself a liberal when you sit down and criticize someone because he believes that you shouldn't be listening to songs or something. Well, if it's a freedom for everyone, everyone has to express his opinion. And then we can sit down and talk. And this applies to the government as well. We have to keep an eye and we have to help them because there are 60 million Egyptians outside this whole political process. And they are waiting for a, you know, a spark of hope. And if they don't find it, they, they might they might turn. And 60 million Egyptians from a wide variety of backgrounds. And isn't the problem that the opposition really isn't unified enough? And uh, for whatever criticism there may be of the Muslim Brotherhood, they did get more than 50% of the vote. Um, and they do have a unified vision um, that is strong and that appeals to uh, a proportion of the Egyptian public. And um, until, until there's a viable opposition, a workable opposition that can really uh, p provide hold the, the authorities to account um, it, it, there's not much more than the Muslim Brotherhood can do I mean they're waiting for that opposition aren't they um, well um, you cannot miss the hypocrisy on both sides really I mean you, you're claiming to be a religious government and you're breaking your promises and you're doing a lot of politically um, like you know a usual political behavior and on the other hand the opposition um, they will tell you this constitution is bad and it's not eligible and it's not good enough for the Egyptians and we should go down to the streets and protest and then a week later they will go to the um, um, the elections and the, the, the parliament election and the oath will include that they should have this to respect the very same constitution that they were telling you it's it's horrible like a couple of months ago I think it, we had to, we have to watch our terminology either opposition or government we have to address um, our followers and our supporters in a different way and and I think um, um, the rest of the Egyptians um, we call them the sofa party people who are just sitting there and watching um, I think they have a better view now after two years um, who is pro who's against the revolution and what should work for everyone and I think uh, uh, the economy and uh, security and is, is a very good uh, point, is a very co good common ground for everyone to start from. And I think the big leaders of the opposition, either El Baradi or Amr Musa or all the, um, this, th this generation has, has, yes, it has a very good to take from it, but it also has a totally different way of thinking, totally different way than us, than the young people who want the change. And I think it, the coming few months, you will see a lot of new leaderships in, in, in the opposition who actually are turning against their, and even in, in, the current, in the current government, who are turning against their leaders because they have seen how much the, the generation differences can affect what they really want to do. And it's, it's, they are obstructing us. But, it, but, but I guess key to the antipathy, key to the agitation on the streets is really what you have is a, after a period of dictatorship, there's, there's, a, there's a big a proportion of Egypt as young. Uh, they want jobs, they want opportunities. And um, that's not going to happen overnight. And the, uh, that kind of job creation and, and giving young people um, a, a purpose and, and, and a career and all those kinds of things, um, that, that won't happen for quite a long time. So we can see this, this um, agitation continuing for quite some time, can't we? It, w it, w it will definitely go on until, if, until as, I, as I'm saying, until the opposition and the government decide to take things differently. So everyone agrees that you have the right to protest. 
but there is an elected government for four years. We have to work. We have to get the police back on its feet. We have to we have to clear and um, purify the judicial system. And once this happens, you will have your own um, 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 rights um, b- being like uh, implemented on the ground. And b- b- when when you have stability and security, I think the economy will just will just be better. I'm, I'm not an econo- uh, an economy uh, expert, but I think in in any given um, situation, you need. Uh, political stability. You need a constitution that has been working um, for a, for a few months at least, and you need a state that you have to deal with a foreign ministry. You have to deal with internal ministry. You have to establish this, and I think this will bring the economy and will lift it up. Um, I'd like to touch on the constitution and the economy a bit later on, but uh, we'll go back to our studio in Washington with Rob. Great, thanks so much, Brendan. And want to see if uh, Dean Ahmad could maybe react to some of the things we heard, specifically thinking about the leadership in Egypt and how effective it has been in, it, in terms of bringing people together and stabilizing the region. So wanted to ask you to maybe focus on um, President Morsi's leadership. We saw on the international stage uh, he was lauded for his uh, interventions into the uh, conflict with Israel and Gaza, but then just a few days later um, he's having clashes with the uh, judges there in Egypt, and now we're seeing him having to resort to calling to states of emergencies to you know, bring down these riots. How effective is he being, and um, is he instilling confidence in people of Egypt and leaders abroad? <clears throat> well, he's uh, losing the confidence of the, of the Egyptians, even some of the people who, who voted for him. But uh, <clears throat> I think that uh, we, I'd like to uh, bring into play here the comment that uh, uh, Mr. Amara made about uh, that uh, we outside of Egypt should be helping the government. That's, that's not the same thing as taking sides among the factions. How we can help the government is to advise them on how proper democratic uh, uh, principles can be implemented in in the situation they're confronting. For example, Morsi has made a number of of, uh, of erroneous uh, he made a number of major mistakes. For example, implementing the state of emergency was a very serious mistake. Uh, it turned uh, what was a an immediate problem about rioting uh, into uh, a situation in which he was evoking the memory of Mr. Mubarak. It, it was Mubarak's state of emergency that was the biggest problem under his rule, and it was the state of it was the slowness with which Morsi uh, and the military removed the state of emergency that caused them to lose political capital in the beginning after the revolution. Uh, and now to bring it back, well, it was just it was just a thorough mistake, and I think that. Uh, another mistake he he made was by trying to have the national uh, uh, authorities implement the curfews with regard to dealing with the riots. He's corrected that mistake, I notice now. He's asking the local authorities to uh, to uh, implement the curfews and to regulate them so that they're being shortened. Uh, somebody, uh, you know, we, we should be guiding him on these ish kinds of issues, giving him this kind of advice. Um, now, regarding the Constitution... Uh, the is, as I said, it is a flawed process that led to it, and it's a flawed constitution. But the Egyptian people have to remember it is much better than what was in place under Mubarak. This constitution, for all its flaws, gives them room to operate and to try to change the situation and to correct the flaws in the existing system, and that's what they should do. Now, having said that, Morsi has to realize that demonstrations are a legitimate tool for doing that. And uh, there is no justification for uh, banning demonstrations. If demonstrations get out of hand and they're violent, then you deal with the violence per se. Now, uh, the issue of who's going to be the, the leadership, I think this brings us back to the question that this whole revolution in, from the beginning was a question of a young generation versus an old generation. It was never secularists versus Islamists. It was never the left versus the right uh, or any other parameter that you or dimension you might want to look at it. It was the young versus the old. And so to the degree that young people can come out and assume leadership positions among all the factions, hopefully those young people will have a better feel for democracy and, and how to operate it. As far as economic policy is concerned, um, you know, that's one of the, di- the issues that has to be put under discussion. Um, it's, I, I have no doubt that a lot of Egyptians just assumed that as soon as Mubarak was out of office, the economy would suddenly spring to life and everything would be much better. 
it doesn't work that way. Uh, the Egyptian government is going to have to sort out the differences among the different factions about the degree of government intervention, about uh, free markets, about taxation policy, about regulations. Uh, these are difficult issues, but the whole point of a democracy is that you sit down and you argue about it, and then in the end you take a vote and decide what you're going to do. And if it doesn't work, uh, then you can try something else or you can vote out the people who made the mistakes. Well, we just have a, a minute to go before we have to take a quick break, but I want to pose this quick question to Nikolai Surkov in Moscow. Seeing this backpedaling from Mubarak um, on some of these issues, is that almost a good sign that he's learning? Uh, this is an emerging democracy, and he makes mistakes, but then he tries to fix them sometimes. Well, it's good that Mr. Morsi is really trying to fix his mistakes because it seems to me that now op secular opposition is really underrepresented in the government. And what Egypt really needs is a national unity government, which will incorporate the opposition and it will show to the people in the streets that their opinion is also heard and considered. Uh, I still see that a huge part of the population didn't support the Muslim Brotherhood, didn't support Mr. Morsi. So their opinion should be taken into consideration. Otherwise, they will have what they already have, I mean, the rights. And the second thing, I, <coughs> I'm sure everybody knows that um, Mr. Morsi paid lots of attention to fighting for power, to consolidating his power, while he had to maybe to share this power in order to take the economy issues first. But we hear actually this week that John Kerry, who's the incoming US Secretary of State, he said that American aid to Egypt um, will continue despite the current unrest. It does suggest, doesn't it, that um, America is investing a lot um, in Egypt and really is very keen to see democracy work there. But in a way, the US has to do that, doesn't it? It's all part of the, the narrative of the Arab Spring. Uh, you are absolutely, absolutely right. Actually, America has no choice but to support Mr. Morsi and the current government. Without their support, uh, the situation can be much worse, especially for the population. So uh, you have to keep uh, providing, uh, first of all, economic aid and secondly, military aid. So it's unavoidable. And, uh, well, you have the biggest Arab speaking and uh, a country with the biggest population in the Middle East. You can't let it with, uh, leave it without help. You can't let it become a chaotic state or even fall apart. So uh, there is nothing the Americans can do right now. All they have to do is support the government, support the country, support some kind of a state, you know, and wait until this new political system gets, gets balanced. Um, uh, Mohammed Imara, uh, opposition activist, um, here in London, it is interesting. I mean, you, you raised the point earlier on that, that America had this kind of uh, d a different approach. I mean, uh, when, when uh, at the outbreak of the Arab Spring, they were a little bit reluctant. Um, you referred to uh, Hillary Clinton, the previous U.S. Secretary of State, saying comments uh, backing Mubarak. And obviously, the Cold War was fought with Egypt, a key part of that, that jigsaw. Um, it is interesting that America is going to continue its support of Egypt, but it really has no choice, doesn't it? And um, do, you, do you detect a degree of hypocrisy in the, uh, the attitude of Washington prior to the Arab Spring and prior to the revolution and, and its position now? Of course, and this is the beauty of it. Um, random people in the streets made uh, the greatest country in our current world change its mind and comply to what they want, even if what they want is um, something that terrifies the Americans or terrifies um, the West, like what we, what they, they think it's an Islamic government. As I told you earlier, there's nothing such as Islamic government, um, even if they claim so. I think the Americans um, had no choice. They need stability. Um, Egypt is a, is, a, is a key player in the in, in, in the region. Uh, they can't afford um, a, a, any further instability in Egypt. The Israelis, you will find them sarcastically pushing hard for things to be quite stable um, um, in Egypt So, because they don't want this disturbance on the borders. They want um, peace from uh, Gaza side and they don't, I mean, this is what they're saying. So um, I think, yes, the Americans have uh, changed their minds. Maybe it was um, in, in a funny way because it was so obvious uh, they were not really supporting the, the people's uh, voice to start with. And I think um, it's it's a good and a bad point. Um, it, it could be a privilege for Morsi to 
um, push the economy forward and 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 uh, get like as any two countries um, deal with each other, get you know m- the mutual benefits. Or the, the, he's got to take this relationship forward in a way that serves Egypt. And on the other hand, it's still um, the, the the opposition. Uh, they will they will not necessarily be um, happy with the Americans help, helping Egypt. Um, but is there some kind of lingering resentment at the support of Mubarak in the past and what America says and does now, or, or is that not a factor at all? Um, I think um, I think this is politics. We have to deal with it. I mean, at some point, um, we, we were all judgmental. We we can't, you know, America is the evil, as like you know, the would an Arabic opposition say, well, we don't deal with it. But now we have to deal with it, and and I think it's not um, bad because you, it's just it's not actually a, an active step the Americans are doing, rather than it's a reflection on the facts on the ground. They are, they have a lot of influence, unfortunately, and it will take some time for all the Arab world to be. Um, responsible for his own foreign policy and, and for it, it will take some time. And, and with regard to the constitution which was raised by Dean, Dean Ahmed, our guest in Washington, um, there, there were some positive elements.